Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to a modest reboot or uh, revival of the disability filibuster um, without the 24-hour marathon dynamic. I am Catherine Fussy, broadcasting from Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I am privileged to live as a settler. Um, as is our practice, we'll begin this afternoon with words of welcome and acknowledgement, and I'll call upon Evelyn Hunchins in just a moment. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you that Evelyn is a member of the Haniguata Turkotan people of the Nimaya Nation. She is the national coordinator for the British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society, an internationally recognized and award-winning Indigenous disability organization. Evelyn. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks for introducing me. And thank you for um, allowing me to take part in this today. Um, so I would as well like to do an acknowledgement and um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, with respect the Lekwungen peoples, also known as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations on um, whose traditional territories Bcans stands. I wanna give thanks to the Lekwungen people for giving me the opportunity to live, work and play on these lands. I also want to give thanks to their ancestors um, for looking after and passing on their cultural teachings of this amazing and beautiful place. Um, Lekwungen people have been caretakers of this land for thousands of years and for that I'm thankful. Um, lastly, I would also like to recognize the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the First Nations whose territories all of you reside on today. Um, territorial acknowledgments um, show recognition and respect for Indigenous peoples, both in the past and the present. Um, recognition and respect are essential elements to establishing healthy reciprocal relationships. And these relationships are key to reconciliation. So thank you for allowing me to give this appreciation today. And I um, hope that you have a great meeting today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. And I hope that you will feel welcome to stay with us for as much of this uh, broadcast as you, uh, as you wish. It is now my great honor to introduce Senator Mary Jane McCallum, who has joined us uh, today. Dr. McCallum is a First Nations woman of Cree heritage and an advocate for social justice. Over the course of her distinguished career and prior to her appointment to the Senate, Dr. McCallum provided dental care to First Nations communities across Manitoba. If I may take a moment, I'd like to say that two days ago, Senator McCallum, and not for the first time, raised her voice in eloquent objection to Bill C-7. Senator McCollum, you stood with us when too many turned away. And your words resonated powerfully for me, as I know they will with the filibuster community, when you called us into the great circle of Indigenous and settler efforts to progress toward a vision of a socially just world that benefits all people. Senator McCallum, we are honored by your presence among us today, and we welcome your guidance as we reflect on the work that we have done and the road that lies ahead. Thank you. Um, I want to begin to tell you that um, I have with me my eagle feather and I have it with me today <clears throat> because um, this is offered in prayer, what I'm going to say, and that um, I did a smudge and to make sure that I had good energy 
and that um, that I carry myself uh, with grace and dignity. I want to thank you for giving me the privilege and opportunity to take part in your filibuster. I am honored to be a part of how you express the soul and spirit of your community through your collective action and activism during and after C7. I understand that you energized your collective action from your homes, your kitchens, your beds, by sharing your passion for justice and love. Remember that no wrong comes from such love, only good. Rem as human beings, we all do the best we can with the parts we play in this moment and give it to the creator to do what needs to be done with it and we let it go. It's not to say we're giving up, but we are not in charge. The creator or God is and he knows what needs to be done. I've learned to let go many times in my life and wait for the next opportunity because it will come. And the opportunity will be presented in a new way. And it will guide us on how we will be able to deal with it. This letting go gave me such a sense of freedom. Because I have faith that when we do our work, that the ones that have passed on our ancestors are all with us today. And at the moment when we have such resistance and, and fight within us. Letting go has not let me down yet. At this moment, what is important to acknowledge is that life is the stories, the humor, the songs, the laughter, the grief, the tears that you shared after the vote, and that these are now vital and instrumental in your next steps to let the world know how precious you all are. When we gather as a collective, and we talk, cry, laugh, we actually practice magic. That magic can influence us in many different ways. This magic energizes us to see how many people of diverse backgrounds are involved in this virtual sit-in, how it will move us into action, to meditate about what has happened, why it happened, and what comes next. You ask yourselves how C7 connected with your regular, regular lives. It connects because it all illustrates the possibility and the power of diversity in community. We learn to turn it into a metaphor for coalition, for further organization. When I say community, I'm now including the Indigenous community and Senate who will be standing alongside you. I want to share a teaching about stones with you. How many of us like to walk, like to pick up stones as we walk? Picking up stones is one of my favorite activities and I have done it all my life. I pick up stones as I walk and take them home. Why did I choose that stone? Because it calls out to us, it calls out to me. The stones I pick up are usually by the water, have been carried there and have felt the motion of the water. They are hungry to move. So they call out to us to pick them up, to take them home, or throw them far out in the water. It's the first time they've gotten to move in thousands of years. The teacher continues, their spirit in creation and everything has a voice. If only we have the ears, or in this case, the spirit to hear. In the Senate office, we received many gifts from many organization. A pen I received this past November came from the disability community and I don't have it on today because I left it in Senate. Didn't realize how I thought I'd be back there, but haven't been. And I asked James Campbell, the Director of Parliamentary Affairs I work with and who's listening today, to contact the organization and ask if we could do a three minute statement on disability for them as a gift back to, the, to you. 
We received the statement from Mr. Belanger, and until that moment, I hadn't thought about the effect of C7 on the disability community. We did the statement, and I asked James to contact Neil to see if he was interested in meeting with our office on C7, and the rest is history. The reason I connect the story of the Stones and the meeting with the disability community was that it was time for the two of us to meet, to pick each other up, and to bring you home to set it. So we could be your voice. It was time for us to move in a different way. We are in this together for the long haul as allies. My office needs to learn from you, stand beside you side by side. We need to ask ourselves, what is the hidden opportunity that lies after the vote on C7? If C7 had been defeated, where would we be? Would we continue to have the opportunity to have the ears of the politicians, the parliamentarians, and the public? I think not. Was it truly defeat? I say no. You are in an unprecedented part of history where your voices are on the Senate floor and hard fought by some senators, and that voice will now be sustained. You are in an unprecedented part of history where you can form allies with different groups across Canada, for example, the Indigenous, the Black, the people of color, the LGBTQ. C7 can be the launch to symbolize your efforts in your lifetime of experiences. It could be a disempowering moment, but, but why would we want to go there? It's an opportunity to not allow the conversation to die down. You have two years or we have two years to make the case before the next phase of C7, and your voices are on the floor. There are no coincidences, no disconnected acts. I wanted to speak to you about victimhood. As a Cree woman who went to residential school, I have my stories of trauma. I argue that women as victim construction is disempowering. I don't regard myself as a vulnerable passive victim but as a strong, capable agent. But I still experience victimization in many different contexts, including laws like the Indian Act. The victim identity itself is psychologically, socially, and politically demoralizing. I cannot afford to see myself solely as victim because my survival depends on the continued exercise of the personal and spiritual powers I possess that were given to me by the creator. And I need those, especially in Senate when we speak in minority. By the same token, I extend the same analogy to the disability community. So do the disability community and indigenous people want protection from the state in C7? It may have the unintended effect of bolstering the paternalistic law and order agenda where amendments to the criminal law render the disability community and indigenous peoples as vulnerable subjects that require protection, hence safeguards by the state. While these amendments may touch on issues that are of concern to the disability community and indigenous peoples, there are no corresponding proposals to promote their civil rights, their mobility, their freedom, their bodily integrity, their substantive equality or other rights they deserve. When we enlist state intervention on C7, the rights bearing status that may be one, may be a qualified one, namely one that exists only to the extent that it is reconcilable with the idea of state-sponsored patriarchal protection of both groups. This would be at odds with the effort to constitute the disability community and indigenous peoples as self-determining agents. Is that not what we are? We are not disempowered and helpless, and we have been able to resist 
accommodate and work through multi-layered experiences. So then, how does the state respect, not protect the disability community and the indigenous peoples? That is a conversation that needs to be had. In closing, I want to share a private and personal moment with you. My daughter sent me a card that said, one day she realized she was more than a survivor. And this is how the card looks. I don't know if you can see it. And uh, one day she realized she was more than a survivor. Because of my 11 years at residential school, and my status as an Indigenous woman. I didn't realize until that moment how often I thought of myself as a victim, and she helped me to see another side of myself that I hadn't seen. She wrote, quote, you have a fight and passion within you, and you stick to your principles. Thank you for being such a warrior. It is an honor and privilege to have you as an example and role model. I want to thank each and every one of you for giving me the honor and privilege to have you, the disability community, as examples and role models of warriors. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Senator McCallum. That was such a a powerful and thoughtful and wise and helpful message for all of us as we uh, as we begin the next phase of this journey. Thank you for bringing us into the Senate, for bringing us into your sphere of understanding and for sharing the message that you have brought to us today, which will resonate, I know, for each of us throughout the day and in the days ahead. It's a great honor for all of us to have a friend like you in the Canadian Senate. Thank you. Thank you, too. Senator McCallum, you are most welcome, of course any time to stay with us, to engage in the conversations that are going to follow and that you have set the tone for so, so beautifully. Um, we understand that you also have many demands on your time, so we, we leave that invitation on the floor for you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to say a word to Senator McCallum while she's here with us? I'm going to stay also, for a while. I would just also like to, to say thank you very, very much for your very profound message. It's appreciated. Thank you for joining us. Okay.